we're live, uh, streaming live on YouTube. I'm Pam Fox. Thank you for joining me in uh, my ongoing Bible study in the book of Revelation. This week we're in chapter 6. There's 22 chapters in the book of Revelation, so we're cruising right along. Uh, last week we discovered that there was one who was worthy to open up this scroll that had seven seals seven wax seals that sealed the scroll and there was um when john thought there was no one worthy to open this scroll he wept but when they found that there was one worthy to open the scroll everyone celebrated mm -hmm. um so evidently this is a big deal this opening of these seals and in chapter six we're going to see jesus open these seals and the way I see it, this chapter really breaks down into three sections. In the first section, we have the one uh, seals one through four opened. And in each of these opening of these seals, John is shown a different vision for each of the seals that are open, uh, one through four. Uh, in the second section, we have uh, seal number five opened. Um, and a curious thing happens. In, in one through four, we see calamity after calamity with each of these seals being open but with um seal number five we see john is given the vision of a very specific group of people that are under this altar and something very amazing happens to them and then in the third part we go back to these calamities opening up the sixth seal where there is a variety of what you would call astronomical or weather calamities um, and none of it's good. <laughs> none of it's good. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump into Revelation. I'm in the King James Version, uh, chapter, chapter 6, verse 1. The first seal. Okay, here we go. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, the Lamb is Jesus of Christ, Jesus of course, and I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he sat, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now before we get too far into these first four seals, I just want to say that people throughout all history have tried to interpret these seals tried to figure out who these riders are on the horse. Each horse is a different color. What does that color represent? Where, what is the symbology? What is this trying to say to us? What kind of information can we glean for, from this that can be beneficial to our lives? Um, and and there's, there's disagreement among Bible scholars, among preachers, among interpreters of this prophecy as to what these things mean, okay? So when we go through this, I'm not gonna say necessarily this means that or this means that, unless it's found elsewhere in the Bible or if it says like right in the next chapter like or in the next verse, if, like Jesus is there like decoding <laughs> what, what has been said, then that's one thing. But really a lot of this is up to, it's speculation. We can try to guess all day who these people are, what these different things represent, um, and we can come to some pretty good conclusions um, but I think for me, the way I'm studying this and the way I'm kind of presenting this is to really look and not focus so much on what we don't know, but focus on what we do know. Focus on what is being said. Focus on the things that we do know in, ter in terms of interpreting the Bible, like some of the easier things, um, like the lamb. When it says the lamb opened one of the seals, we know that's Jesus. There's no one will argue with that. We know that's Jesus. Um, so here we have this first seal is opened, and John sees a vision of a white horse, okay, and someone sitting on the horse holding a bow, which would, you think, like bow and arrow. When Usually when you hear someone say gun, they don't say guns and bullets, but you know that there's probably bullets involved, involved with that gun. And it says, a crown was given unto him. And we'll see here in this first verse, we'll see also in the second verse, and then I think we'll see again in the in the seventh verse so seals one two and four where something is given to the rider on the horse something is given to them all right so what does this mean what is this horse who is this rider what is it what does it all mean well what we do know 
is that um, a horse represents a war animal. Like if someone in the Bible comes riding on a donkey or a camel, there's, it's not, you know, those aren't war animals. Those are livestock animals or work animals, but a horse is a war animal. So that's number one. So this horse is white. Uh, usually white is symbolic of purity or, you know, truth, or, yeah, purity, um, innocence. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's what we're looking at here. Um, these different horses are different colors, and some people think the colors could represent countries, like their flag colors. Um, it could represent a variety of different things. I don't know what, they, what these colors represent, so we're just going to move right past that. We know the horse is a war animal. He says um, uh, the person riding on the horse had a bow, which is a war weapon. Okay, so we have a war animal and a war weapon. Um, and it says the crown was given unto him, which represents authority, kingship, leadership. It represents, a crown represents being royalty, basically, or a king. Um, so so this, this first rider is riding on a war animal, is holding a weapon, and he's been given authority um, as a leader or a king. And it says he went forth conquering and to conquer. So right away, right here in the first verse, we see this first seal being opened, and we see really everything pointing towards war, okay? Um, and then we go on to the second seal in verse 3, and we see it continue to point towards war. Verse 3, when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. So let's get a picture of this. Let's get back into the throne room of heaven as we're going through Revelations and really picture what's happening here. John is in the throne room of heaven. There's the throne there. God sits on the throne. Jesus is there. The Spirit of God is there. Um, the lampstands are there. The altar is there. And um, these four beasts are there. And for whatever reason, um, for each one of these first four seals, we see a beast beckon John and say, Come, I'm going to show you. And remember, the beasts have eyes in the front and the back, which I take to mean they can see into the past and the future. And they're, they're giving John a glimpse of what is, what is to come. These things in, chap in Revelation chapter 6 are not the wrath of God. And we'll see that at the very end of the chapter. It says that the wrath of God is still to come. So these aren't, these aren't things God is like pouring out onto the earth to punish people. This is just a glimpse of the future, the things that are going to happen. And, and John is being given a glimpse of this in in sign form or in you know in in this in this symbolic format where he's given the vision and then it kind of has to be interpreted really to to be able to understand because it's not clear kind of like dreams are they're not always clear uh so anyway so these four beasts are, are beckoning john come and see and then they're giving john these visions of these four different seals so here we are at the second seal uh when he had opened the second seal i heard the second beast say come and see and there went out another horse that was red and the and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another and there was given unto him a great sword okay so here we have the second seal he says come and see he goes and he looks and what does he see he sees another horse this horse is red okay the first one was white second one was red and it says and power was given to him that sat thereon so now we have the rider of this horse, and again, power has been given to whoever this person is. Um, so we start to kind of get the picture that these that John is seeing these uh, these uh, um, authoritative leaders in 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 the world um, that have power. They have the authority and they have the power, really, to start uh, and to participate in war. So power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. If that's not war, I don't know what is to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And again, a sword is symbolic for a war weapon. A sword is symbolic for, just like the bow, it's symbolic for a war weapon. So here we see this continuation of war um, under this one that was given power to take peace from the earth, riding on a red horse. Now, whether these different events are going to take place simultaneously or chronologically, it doesn't say. It doesn't really say, like, it doesn't give those details. So, again, we need to focus on what, what it is saying here, and it's talking about uh, war in our future. And you might think, well, so what? We've always had war, and that's true. We have always have, we've always had war. I'm sure there's a war taking place somewhere in the world as we speak. 
Um, and so as we go through this, uh, uh, this week's chapter, next week's chapter, what you'll begin to see is this, um, uh, uh, what Jesus likened unto birth pains, right? When a woman goes into labor, it might start out kind of like not so bad, a little bit of back pain, a little bit of Braxton Hicks, the water break, breaks, the contractions get stronger, they get closer together, they get more intense. And so you have almost the steam rolling of um, pain and discomfort that occurs with labor. And that's what we're going to see um, as these seals open up. And then, of course, after the seals, we'll see uh, we have the seven seals and then we have the seven trumpets and then we have the seven bowls. Um, and so, and you'll start to see, it's like, can it get much worse? Yeah, it can get much worse and it keeps getting worse. So here we have war with the first and the second seal. We have war. Let's move on to verse five, the third seal. Uh, and when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou, see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Okay, so he has uh, balances in his hands, which are scales, right? So in Bible times, when it came to commerce, when it came to trade, when it came to buying and selling, like if you went to buy like wheat or barley or, or herbs or whatever, they would put it on the scale and they would weigh it, kind of like when you go to the, the grocery store today to weigh your bananas or your apples or whatever, to determine what the cost is. So we have a product and we have a determination of the value of that product with those balances. Um, but he hears a voice in the midst of the four beasts, which means it could be one of the four beasts talking, but it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't have to be. It says he heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts and we know that Jesus is there in the throne room um, so it could be Jesus talking but it doesn't say but it, the, the voice is a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of uh, barley for a penny and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine so whoever is speaking is a person of authority so I'm going to imagine it's it's Jesus because he's basically saying see thou hurt not the oil and the wine so what are they talking about here with the wheat and the barley and the oil and the wine well, again, most people agree that, um, that this is indicative of famine because as you have war, war oftentimes leads into um, inflation, the, you know, the price of goods go up. And so then you have people, you know, struggling to feed their families because they can't afford to buy the food because it's so expensive or whatever. They can't afford to buy the gas or they can't afford to buy whatever it is, pay their bills, pay their rent because everything is so expensive. And so really this is a picture, most would agree that, you know, in these times of war, it's going to be so bad that people are going to go hungry because the cost of food is going to be so high. Um, and that sounds good to me. And then he, uh, a measure of wheat for a penny, which would say, and three measures of barley for a penny. Um, am I in the King James Version? I am in oh, King James Bible, King James Version, Revelation 6. Oops, I just found the Genesis. Okay. Um yeah, so other versions, other versions use a different word, like a denarius instead of a penny, um, two pounds of wheat for a day's wages, six pounds of barley for a day's wages. So this is, a, this is painting a picture of basically buying, you know, a small amount of wheat or barley or food for an entire day's wages is what it's saying here. Um, and the only thing I wanted to really mention about that was and then oh and then it says and see that hurt not the oil and the wine so again most people agree that this is saying that because the barley and the wheat are like affordable peasant food during bible times whereas the olives and wine grapes and olive oil those things were more of luxury foods basically they're saying that there will come a day where there's war there's inflation the cost of foods gets really high for the common man but for the wealthy they're not affected 
probably because they have money and they can afford these things. Um, I just want to throw something out here. This isn't something um, that I read anywhere or I heard anywhere, but I just want to throw out and point out that when the Bible talks about wheat and harvest and grapes or olives, this is, um, it reminds me of the harvests. When we go back into the Old Testament, there's a lot of um, really harvest talk throughout the whole Bible. And a lot of times this harvest talk is pointing towards the end times and it's pointing towards the harvest of people. And we haven't talked a whole lot about the rapture on this channel yet. So just really quick, I talked a little bit about this last week. Everyone who believes in the rapture really has kind of a difference of opinion in when the rapture will happen, right? Some people think it's going to happen before this tribulation. Some people think it's going to happen right in the middle of the tribulation. And some people think it's going to happen towards the end of the tribulation. There's also a group of people that say all of the above, that there's going to be more than one rapture. And to me, I mean, I love that idea. And there is biblical um, scripture to support that. Um, there's biblical scripture to support all of these um, different rapture events. It just depends on how you're interpreting the word and it depends on how uh, well studied of the entire word you are. Um, but, um, but yeah, so some people believe that there's gonna be more than one rapture. So there'll be an initial rapture um, and in harvest time there was an initial, there were three types of harvest. The uh, harvest, there was the wheat harvest, which happened in early spring. There was the, or excuse me, the barley. There was the wheat that happened in late spring, and then in the fall, there was the, the olives and the grapes and other fruits. So you had these three different harvest times, and, and the people lived and died by the harvest times, right? That was their calendar. But within each of the different harvest times were three um, categories, if you will. There was the initial harvest, which they called first fruits, which that portion of the harvest was sacrificed. It was dedicated to God. Then there was the main harvest, which was the, the main harvest which is how people earn their income and they fed their families or whatever. And then there was the gleanings, which is what they, they would remove the workers from the field and they would leave what was left over. Like maybe, so you had the first 10% was the first fruits and then you had the gleanings was another 10% and then everything in between. So these gleanings would be, you know, for the poor people to, who didn't have money, they could come and they could, they could just take what they wanted from, from what was left over in these crops. That was the gleanings. And so why am I saying all this? Well, this group of people that believes there's going to be more than one rapture, this is one of the things they base it on are these different types of harvests and these different categories of, of harvest. So how does that translate? It would translate as there being an initial harvest, being like a fir first fruits, and then a main harvest, which would be a massive harvest of people, Jesus taking into heaven. And then um, the gleanings, which would be that, what's that which is left over, um, and then, of course, you have the three different um, seasons throughout the year with barley, the wheat, and the, and the olives and the wine. So I, I just throw that out there because I think it's interesting that um, of all things that it mentions here, it mentions wheat, barley, olives, and grapes. I'm going to try to get back to where I was at. There, there we are. Okay, so... Um, yeah, and so we just have to wait and see. <laughs> when it comes to the rapture, we have to wait and see. I know a lot of people are really passionate um, and convicted about their beliefs as, in terms of when the rapture is going to happen. I'm not necessarily passionate about it. I'm more of a wait and see kind of person. I like to believe that there's going to be more than one rapture because that means that, um, you know, when the first group is taken up, there's still hope for everybody else left behind. Great hope, in fact, if there's really going to be this, you know, huge harvest main harvest taken the second time around um so we just have to wait and see okay so let's go on so we're up to the third seal um famine fourth seal verse seven and when he had opened the fourth seal i heard the voice of the fourth beast say come and see and i looked and behold a pale horse so all the other horses, we had a red horse, a black horse, a white horse. This horse is a pale horse. It's not even a color. It's just a pale horse. I don't know what that means. Excuse me. And his name that sat on him was death. Hell followed with him. <laughs> so this guy's name is death and hell follows with him. That sounds pretty bad. To me, it sounds like it's referencing the Antichrist and the, the beast, the Antichrist and the, 
and the and the false prophet, which we'll 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 learn about more later in Revelation. But I mean, he's got death and hell followed with him. That's probably what they're talking about. But either way, it's bad. We got death on this horse. Hell is following with him, and the power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth. So a quarter of the earth, these two, this death and hell are going to have power over a quarter of the earth. So that's a pretty big deal. To do what? To kill with sword, with hunger, with death. You're going to kill with death. I guess, I, I mean, I guess that means maybe disease, to kill with disease. So they're going to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and with the beasts of the earth. Whatever that means. I mean, the wild, the beast represents like the wild animals of the earth as opposed to like the livestock and the domesticated animals. So they're going to kill with the beast of the earth. A quarter of the world. Okay, that's the fourth seal. Now, this is what I, this is what I call part two of Revelation 6 is the fifth seal. Now here, this is the, the sign that John, or the vision that John has given of a group of people under the altar. So let's read it and then we'll talk about it. And when he had opened, verse 9, and when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that, on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also, and their brethren, that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. All right. So he sees this group of people. He calls them souls, but they have a voice. They can talk, but he sees them under the altar. Now we know there in the throne room that there's this altar. Um, and if we look, I brought it up, if we look elsewhere in the book of Revelation, that word altar comes up seven or eight times. And we'll see in chapter eight, we'll see the altar there again, the same altar, only it's called the altar, and then it's called the golden altar, which was before the throne, much incense. It's, um, and then in verse nine, again, the golden altar, it talks about the golden altar. Um, so it talks about this altar in heaven um, several different times in the book of Revelation. Sometimes it's just referred to as the altar. Other times it's referred to as the golden altar. So what is this golden altar? Well, if we go back into the Old Testament when God uh, originally instructed Moses on how to build the temple and all the things inside of the temple, one of the things he instructed him to build, actually two of the things he instructed him to build was, was um, two different altars. The first altar was called a brazen altar, and it was the altar where they actually burned the, they burned the animals, right? This, the animal sacrifice where they would, you know, slit the animal's throat and they would put it on this altar and it would, and it would burn. Um, that was the brazen altar, and it was, you know, God told Moses exactly how to build it and, and, and um, encase it in brass. Uh, all the dimensions and all of that. But he also instructed him to build a golden altar of incense. Um, you can see it there in the Old Testament, the dimensions, only this one was um, plated with gold. Um, it has these four horns on it. It has the, the crown around the edges. Um, and, and it doesn't describe really, I imagine there's a bowl there because, because it's for burning incense. And then under that bowl would, would be where the fire was. So under the altar would be where the fire is. And so why do I bring this up? And why am I not glossing over this? Well, it just occurred to me when I was reading this. It's like these souls are under the altar. I find that curious. Like, why are they under the altar? Of course, it goes on to say that this kind of a holding place. They're there waiting um, to receive their white robes, which is their glorified bodies. Um, and they're waiting to be gathered together with their other brethren who will be martyred. So these are people that will be martyred during the tribulation. These are people that will die for their faith. They will be killed. They will be executed because they re refuse to worship the beast, because they insist on spreading the, spreading the name of Jesus, because they insist on sharing the good news, um, even though it'll probably be against the law. I mean, obviously, if they're going to be murdered for their faith. So, but anyway, getting back to this golden altar, when I asked the, when I asked myself the question, like, why are these souls under the golden altar? And I, and I Googled a picture of the golden altar of incense and it's this, you know, 
because there is such good instruction on how to build this in the Old Testament, there are plenty of images of these things and kind of give us an idea of what they look like. But it's like, you know, this bowl where they would put the incense and they would burn incense every morning and every night. That was part of these, um, the priesthood. One of their jobs was to always be burning this incense. And the incense, by the way, are symbolic of the prayers of the saints. Um, and so when I asked myself, why are these souls under this altar? What came to my mind, because there's fire under that altar, is the story um, of Abshak, Meshach, and Abednego. Do you guys remember this? These were three servants of God who were living under, they were really, they were slaves. They were living under the rule of another, in another country. They'd been taken out of their country and living in another country. They were given these new names, Abshak, Meshach, and Abednego. And it was mandatory to worship the statue, um, King Nebuchadnezzar, I believe it was, yeah. Um, it was, he made it mandatory to worship this statue every day. And Abshag, Meshach, and Abednego served God. And so they're like, no, we're not going to do it. And so their punishment was death. And so they were actually thrown into the fiery furnace for being faithful to God, for not worshiping this image, this idol. Um, they were faithful to God. They were thrown into the fiery furnace, but God saved them. So obviously he didn't save these souls because they're dead. And now they're under the altar. Um, but he saved Abshak, Meshach, and Abednego because they did not worship this idol. Um, and how did he save them? They were thrown into this fiery furnace, a very hot fiery furnace, where they should have died and been incinerated immediately. But they were in there and they were fine. And so <laughs> the king was like, he was like, what in the world? He's looking in there and he sees these three guys, but he sees four guys. And he says one of them memory serves correctly. But anyway, so so then these three, Abshak, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they come out of the fiery furnace. And they're fine. They're not even smoky. Like, they're not singed. They're perfectly fine. Their clothes are fine. They're fine. Everything's fine. Um, so God saved them, even though, um, even though they didn't worship this idol. And so here we have this group of souls that didn't worship the idol. They were faithful to their God, um, but they died for their faith. They were martyrs, but they are put under the golden altar of incense. Um, that's all I'm going to say about that because that's really all I got. I don't really get it. I really don't know why they're under there. That's just what it made me think of. It made me think of that story of Abshak, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, so let's go back. So uh, he sees uh, this group of people, these souls, under the altar. Uh, verse... Verse 11, oh, they, and they cry out with love so long. So they're asking God, how, how much longer until you're gonna, we're going to be vindicated, till the people who killed us are going to have their justice? Um, and they're told to wait for yet, uh, they're told to wait for a little season, but they're given white robes um, to every one of them, which is uh, symbolic for the glorified body, um, and told they should rest yet for a season until their fellow servants also so the tribulation is still happening at this point. These people have died for their faith. They're under the altar. The tribulation is still going on. And there's still going to be more people who are martyred for their faith and, and are going to join them. Okay. All right. Let's go on. Verse 12. And this is the third part of the chapter. Uh, there's a couple more verses here. But in this, in this third part, uh, we go back to opening the seals. We're at the sixth seal. And by the way, there are seven seals. Um, here in chapter 6, it goes through seal 1 through 6. In chapter 7, there are no seals open. And then in chapter 8, we're going to open the seventh seal. But something else is going to happen um, in chapter 7. We're going to take a little break from opening the seals, a little Sabbath from opening the seals. So verse 12, it says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bond man, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, 
and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Oh, I thought that said, for the great day of his wrath is to come, and who shall be able to stand? Well, it kind of is indicative of that when it says, who shall be able to stand, like it's still a future event. I don't know. I still don't believe that these events are the wrath of God. I believe that the bulls towards the end of the book of Revelation are the wrath of God, because it says so. Um, these are just future events that John is being a, given a glimpse of. But these people are going to say, uh, they, they believe the day of his wrath is come. And they ask the question, who shall be able to stand? So let's take a closer look at here, the sixth seal. Um, this is a, a very, um, a picture of terror, a great picture of terror, because we have these incredible uh, weather catastrophes or astrological, what do we have? So first of all, it starts out with a great earthquake. And then we have like a lunar and a solar eclipse, if you will. It says the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood. And it says the stars of heaven fell onto the earth, which I guess would be like a great meteor shower, um, which we're going to see a lot of that coming up. These meteor showers, if you will. Um, uh, so the stars of heaven fell onto the earth. And the heaven departed as a scroll and it is rolled together. Now, I'm not sure what he's seeing there, but a scroll would roll up on both ends, right? And then you would unroll it like that. So it's saying that um, it departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. So when you let, when you open a scroll up and then you let it go, it rolls back together on its own, right? So he's saying the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. I'm not really sure what he's seeing there. And, and again, he's just doing the best he can to describe what he's seeing, but he sees this scroll rolling together in the sky. And then he says, every mountain and island were moved out of their places. So this earthquake and this meteor shower, there it's a big deal, enough to cause every mountain. So this isn't symbolic here. This is, he's being very clear. Every mountain and every island were moved out of their places. And of course, you and I know that this world I don't know if you guys follow, um, thank you. I don't know if you guys follow, uh, there's a guy on YouTube that he's like a, well, there's a couple of them, but one of them that I follow, I can't remember his name, but he's like a retired uh, scientist or something like that. And he, he does all these reports on these worldwide earthquakes and he shows like all, there's all of this uh, software that shows the seismology around the earth and all the different activity. The activity, the seismologic, seismological activity on this earth is happening all the time as we speak. And all, it shows all of these different fault lines all around the earth and all of this different activity along these fault lines. And according to him, like the seismological activity has been increasing like birth pains for the last couple of really for the last several decades. But in the last decade, it's really been kind of compounding. Um, in fact, this week alone, there's been a, a ton of earthquake activity. Um, we're talking about all around the world. Um, and it's not just like level two, three, and four. We're talking like level five, six, and seven. So these are big earthquakes. We just don't hear about it because, you know, the news is too busy reporting about COVID and politics and all of that stuff. But, but these things are happening. And here it's talking about a great earthquake. It's going to cause every mountain and island to be moved out of their places. So this is a really um, a, a big deal. And then it goes on to say that the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, the mighty men, so it's really painting a picture here of wealthy, authoritative kings, presidents, governors, leaders, you know, rich people, well, it says men, are going to hide themselves but it also says every bond man and every free man now a bond man my understanding well a bond servant i think is the same thing as a bond man we've talked about this before it was when a person would volunteer to be somebody's servant right like so let's say let's say during the bible times i'm somebody's servant i somebody buys me and i'm their servant and they treat me really really well and then when my servant time is up because there was always a, a limit on how long you could own a slave I think it was I can't remember what it was I can't remember if it was six years or if it was more than that but 
when the time limit came up, if I say, I want to be your servant forever, then I would become a bond servant because I'm volunteering to remain a servant to my master because my master has treated me so well and provided for me so kindly. Uh, so here it says every bond man and every free man. So it, to me, it just paints a picture of people in um, captivity, bond man, and every free man, which would be everybody else. So in a, in a sense, this is really, I don't know, it's everybody. Everybody hid themselves in the dens and in the, and in the, and in the rocks of the mountains. They hid themselves. And so when these, when these, when this earthquake and these meteor showers occurred and it moves every island and every mountain, and remember all of these fault lines that we, that we know about, it can kind of cause everything to shift and change and be different than what we know it, right? Um, and so, and so these land masses apparently are going to be moving around. And so it's going to create these, I, I'm, I'm guessing it's going to create all of these many dens and crevices um, for people to hide in. And so they're going to seek a place to hide and they're going to hide and they're going to cry out to the rocks and to the mountains, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. So there is, in essence, it sounds like they're, they're wanting to die. They're, they're so scared and it's, and it's so terrible what is happening here that they wish they were dead. Have you ever been in a situation like that? I have once. One time I went out on, on the ocean here, the Pacific Ocean, with my father-in-law, who is a retired commercial fisherman. But he wanted, we had this new fancy video camera, and he thought, oh, come out with us, and we'll film a day in the life of a commercial fisherman. Okay, that sounds like fun. <laughs> so we get out there, and the boat is doing, you know, it's, like, it's doing this, like up and down and up. And I got so sick. I just hung myself, I, I put down the camera and I hung myself over the side of the boat. And as the boat was doing this up and down, I literally was staring at the water and wishing like that I could fall in the water and drown because I was so horribly seasick. I threw up over and over and over until I couldn't throw up anything anymore, but I was still so miserable. I, it's the only time in my life where I was just like, I wish so desperately that I was just dead. Like. I, I had no fear of death in that moment because it would have been better than, than <laughs> anyway, I'm sure that experience is nothing compared to what they're talking about here. They are going to experience so much terror and desperation that they're going to cry out to the rocks and to the mountains, fall on us and hide us. So it, so it doesn't say they're saying fall on us and kill us, it says fall on us and hide us. So they're, they're wanting to hide. They're wanting to hide from the face of him that sit on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. All right, so that's it for chapter six. So next week we'll be in chapter seven, which kind of continues on. Um, so we had the uh, seals one through six. In chapter seven, we're going to be talking more about these 144,000, which I've already to a little bit. And that's the thing about the book of Revelation. It's not, it wasn't written like in easy to understand chronological order. It really just kind of bounces all over the place and you have to, literally study it like you have to read it over and over and over to kind of get these little glimpses and these little nuggets and these little revelations as to what it's talking about and of course it helps to have you know a, a key a book like i'm using this book, but there are so many books that have been written uh, or websites that you can look up to kind of help you um move through the book of revelation but i've just been kind of moving through it prayerfully for the most part and and then just going to and throw to and fro throughout the word because we have technology i mean like when i do a little word study in the word altar i'm just in my bible app i just go into the search bar i type in altar revelation and it brings up seven times that the word altar is used in the book of revelation and so we can kind of get a picture as to what they're talking about when he says he sees these souls under the altar it's like what the heck is he talking about um we still don't completely understand. We can't. We don't have the mind of God and that type of understanding. But we get a little bit better of a picture as to as to what he's talking about there. Um, and so don't be afraid to do a word search. Uh, if you if you haven't already, make sure you upload a Bible app on your phone so that you can. I mean, your computer works too. But when you have it on your phone, it's nice because then. When you're thinking about these things and you're studying these things and maybe you know you can grab your phone when you have a question be like well what about this and you can go and you can search it and 
using that Bible app to kind of get a better understanding as to what they're talking about. Um, I did a Bible, a word study this week on, um, on 40 days and 40 nights. You can look that up and see all the different times the Bible talks about 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, I did another word study on, um, what was it? I forget now. Anyway, I recommend that. If you don't have a Bible app on your phone, get one. They're free if you want to put up with the ads or you can do the paid version. I just have the free one. But um, And then you can also see, you know, the red letter version. You can see the words of Jesus. You can, again, do a word search. You can um, look up the Strong's um, by, you know, tapping on a word and it brings up the Hebrew and you can see what that word meant and how it's used throughout the Bible um, in different ways. So all great resources. There are many great resources. In fact, today I, I uploaded uh, on my computer, um, have you guys heard of eSword? It's still, okay, it finished. It took a little bit, to, it took a little time to download, but I haven't used it yet, but I always see other people using eSword. It's, it's a, a really cool, it really goes deep into the strongs. Like instead of just giving that surface kind of definition of some of these words, it really kind of goes deep into what these words uh, meant when at the time that they were written so all right uh graduating into greatness hello and it's uh thank you for your comment <laughs> elizabeth sandoval uh, thank you for your comment and cheryl hello right back at you so that's it for today god bless you guys thank you so much for watching and we'll be back next week i try to do these saturday mornings around 11 this morning i forgot it was saturday i got going on a project and i just forgot what day it was so here I am in the afternoon, but I really do enjoy um, doing, uh, going through the, doing this Bible study. I just, uh, it's incredible to me. I'll, I'll, I'll say one more thing and then I'll finish this up. I went to a concert many years ago and I can't even remember the name of, of the band. It was a Christian band. It wasn't DC Talk, but it was one of those older bands. Anyway, at the end, they came out for an encore and the guy was, they were kind of doing this, you know, the music was playing in the background and he was giving a little sermon and he said, the one prayer God will always say yes to, the one question, the one thing you're going to ask God that he will always say yes to, he said, is to ask God to give you a deep hunger and a thirst for the word of God. And I remember thinking, oh, I need that because I hated reading the Bible and I really had a love-hate relationship with the Bible. And so I started praying that and for years I would pray that and I still like, I really struggled with the Bible. Today, God has finally said yes to that prayer. I really look forward to reading the Bible. I have a hunger for the Bible. I have a fascination with the Bible. Uh, so God did answer yes to that prayer. So if you're really struggling in your faith, to me, the best way you can grow your faith is to be in the Word of God. That is number one way, in my opinion, you can grow your faith, is to be in the Word of God consistently. Um, but I know that's hard sometimes because it can be confusing or it can be boring or you can be like, what is, what is, why does this need this even matter? Um, but the more you study it, the more fascinating it becomes. At least that's been my experience. So anyway, God bless you guys, and I'll see you right back here next week.